So good. Hello, everyone. Definitely yeah. good to see you all again. Um, welcome to meet two of the bad news. Um, as we so, so we're kind of just trying to frame up some of the challenges. And like, there's like, the challenges are like overwhelming. So like, my hope is like you know go home and feel like you need to like medicate yourself or something. But um, I just think that these are but what's dramatic about these things is that they're uh, the evidence of them. They're almost sort of self-validating that these are challenges that are facing in society. And they're just things that I don't find or like a lot of people speaking about, like in a church context. I think a part of the reason I wanted to do the class is to maybe uh, hear from you all in one respect and maybe even start working to try to find my own voice in some of these things, which means that maybe whatever my voice is like, it's about to refine. So that's my apologia for this class. Like, okay, I've already done this before, so like everybody be nice. Uh, my thing is, I act close to <laughs> Introductions. Uh, the last week introductions is this way or other been visiting about one. Al, uh, Jackie, will you? Those are our Yes. Thank you. Just make sure it's a lot. Thank you. Take a just... Well, I found that many of the critical issues that compel right writers, I mean, that's, should say writers, in this space can be found in essential form by reading carefully the forewords and prologues and introductions to the text. So I had a stack of books like this, it's all on my diary table. Where it came through introductions, forward the prologues, and um, lots of delicious things. Um, yeah, let me just take one down, pass it around. Um, so what's kind of derived is from it's an excerpt from the forward of this book, The Essential Agrarian Reader. So last week we talked about um, Wendell Berry's uh, influential, some might say monumental text. Uh, the Unsettling of America, Culture and Agriculture. So at the 50th anniversary of the writing of that book, there was a conference at uh, like Georgetown or something. Else. And they had a bunch of lecturers and speakers come in, and they took all those lectures and compiled them into this book of essays. And so that's what this book of essays is, is it's sort of a 50-year uh, reflection on some of the issues that were originally addressed in um, the Unsettling of America. And then Barbara Kingslover, or Kings, Kings Solver, it's probably some of the have said, say we familiar with her, it's just a writing business. Yeah, yeah, so she wrote the foreword to this book. And this is the beginning of what you have in front of you. So when you, everybody has one, because just read through it carefully together. Uh, and the reason I thought this is a great read is because to me, sometimes these things start to feel, I mean, like everything else in our world, these things can easily start to feel part of, of artisan, or they can start to feel political, or they can start to feel polarizing. And I will really want the way that she says this, these are just like human issues. These are societal issues. And she says, I believe in a red state, I tend to think blue and mostly agree. If you're looking for oversimplification, skip the likes of me. Whatever yet, Skip the whole idea. Recall that in one of those red states, just a razor's edge under half the voters likely pulled the lever, uh, pulled the blue lever, and vice versa. Not to mention the greater numbers everywhere who didn't even show up at the poll. So far as they, so far did they feel from affectionate toward any of the available options. Recall that farmers and hunters historically are more active environmentalists than many progressive city-dwelling vegetarians. And conversely, that some of the strongest land conservation movements on the planet were born in the midst of cities. Recall that we all have the same requirements of oxygen and drinking water, and that we all like them clean, but uh, relentlessly pollute them. Recall that whatever folly things you might, I'm sorry, whatever lofty things you might accomplish today, you will do them only because you first ate something that grew out of dirt. We don't much care to think of ourselves that way as creatures whose cleanest aspirations depend ultimately on the health of our dirt. But our survival as a species depends on our uh, coming, sorry, so it says courting, coming to grips with that along with other corollary notions. And when I entered a comfortable midlife, I began to see that my kids would get to do the same someday or not, depending on how well our species can start owning up to its habit, habitat and its name. 
As we face one environmental crisis after another, did our species seek to make this connection? As we say back home, do not so as you notice. Please. If a middle-aged woman studying agriculture seems strange, try this on for Bazaar. Most of our populace and all of our leaders are participating in a mass hallucinatory fantasy in which the megatons of waste we dump into our rivers and bays are not poisoning the water. The hydrocarbons we pump into the air are not changing the climate. Overfishing is not depleting the oceans. Fossil fuels will never run out. Or is the kill masses of, civil of civilians are an appropriate way to keep our hands on what's left. We are not desperately overdrawn at the environmental bank, and really, the kids are all right. Good crank. Middle levity here. Good Okay, if nobody else wanted to talk about this, I could think about it myself and try to pay for my part of the damage, or at least start to tally up the bill. This requires a good deal of humility and a ruthless eye toward an average household's confusion between need and want. I reckon I might get somewhere if I organized my life in a way that brought me face to face with what I am made of. The values I long to give my children, honesty, cooperativeness, thrift, mental curiosity, physical competence, we are intrinsic or intrinsic to my agrarian childhood where the community organized itself around this sustained effort of meeting people's needs. These values, I think that's the end of the parentheses, these values I knew would not flow naturally from an aggressive consumer culture devoted to the sustained effort of inventing and enforcing people's wants. <coughs> and I could not, as any parent knows, prohibit one thing without offering others. So we would start with the simple and obvious, eschewing fast food and slow food for flow, slow food, with the resulting time spent together in the garden and in the kitchen regarded as a plus, not a minus. We would skip TV in favor of interesting family work. We would participate as much as possible in the production of the things our family consumes and the disposal of the things we no longer need. It's easy to ignore damage you don't see and to undervalue things you haven't made yourself. Starting with food. Be saying, uh, we, very she's such, she's, such, she's such a good writer, but, um, and this is she, the the forward is extended, so you can you know check this out from the library and read the longer version if you want. The citation is there at the bottom of the page, but um, I'm sure the other version won't have the typos. Um, I love that she says this is not uh, red state, blue state. This isn't uh, rich and poor. This isn't rural, urban. Right? These are just all human things. We all. Um, realize that whatever we've done today, she said that the beginning of this first progress, we do it by the power of whatever it is that we ate, that grew up in dirt, kind of just come out of dirt, going back to dirt, and dirt, and you've come, dirt, you're going to return. When she says, we join in this mass hallucinatory fantasy, she says, where we continue to live, live as if everything's fine, um, and the Economists have a way of uh, talking about this, where you, where you have um, displaced the true costs of things, that you've um, not taken the cost of account. And one of the things that we'll get to eventually, probably not tonight, is just that all of the food that we eat is artificially cheap because of two things, because of number one, it's subsidized. So uh, ultimately as a society, the tax base right, is paying for it in some sense, so we've paid for it once when we pay our taxes. And then the other thing is that it's artificially cheap because some of, many of the true costs have been externalized and not taken into account, right? So nobody's paying for um, the loss of topsoil, right? No one's paying, nobody's paying, right, for nitrogen runoff, for, uh, you know, nitrogen balloons of the Gulf of Mexico, right? Who's paying for that, right? If anybody's paying for it again, it's probably taxpayers and governments, but no one's paying for it uh, at, you know, at the till when they're checking out the broccoli or whatever. So anyway, Barbara King's, uh, King Solver and, and enjoy uh, uh, corrective actually homes. So this guy, sorry, H.J. Massingham uh, was a British writer of the last century, and he started writing here just after World War II. So, I have, again, I have a whole stack of introductions and things that I love and that are delicious from <laughs> introductions and forwards of folks. 
Just a couple of them here. So I've done. Wars is a rampant A relentless battle has raged ever since the end of World War II, with the forces of rampant materialism being seemingly intent on destroying the natural and social worlds upon which all human life depends. On the whole, opposition to naked self-interest in recent decades has been sporadic, couched in apologetic terms and differential to the achievements of modernity. By contrast, massing at work on the rich heritage of past culture with its common interest in respect for God's earth and its people, peoples, is based on the local English heritage of farm, home as productive unit, <coughs> and landscape. It consumes to strike a common chord. I'm sorry, that's supposed to say continues. I'm sorry, it continues to strike the common chord with the indigenous peoples in their localities across the world as they struggle against the cancer of globalization. Identifying the enemy is halfway to winning the battle. Massingham identifies finance as the destroyer of the stable agriculture of a thousand years. The commercialization of industry together with the industrialization of agriculture lies at the heart of the problems facing the globalized world. Working for money has come to dominate all other value systems so that people no longer work for the love of their land and the whole of God's creation, but merely for a narrow self-interest. In the process, a host of malfunctions have emerged, each generating its very own band, brand of specialist protesting fanatics. And so, um, maybe what I am here, I guess, to speak, yeah. <laughs> specialist protesting fanatic. <laughs> Right, so I think that as we make our way through, we'll see that this, uh, like there's, there's so much packed into these few sentences. But part of what this book, The Tree of Life, is a really good book if you're able to find one to get your hands on it. Um, and in it, Mansingham just talks about how the, um, the movements of the scripture in general are agrarian, right? That, uh, Jesus, you know, even is portrayed as rural. You know, I don't know if we always think about Jesus as rural, like think about Jesus being from a small backwater town. You know, you think of Jesus not growing up in Nazareth would be like, you know, something like, you know, growing up in Cleveland or Pahuska or, you know, some little town that that most people have never heard of. And by the time you get to the big city, people were like, yeah, I kind of heard of that, I guess. Is there anything really good? Did anything good come out of Pahuska and Cleveland? I had read Drummond. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and Cleveland had the dairy diner. He died there. So this is going to be um, uh, just a list. I kind of worked um, with themes taken from some of these books and a little bit with Chat GPT, and we kind of worked together a categorized list of some of these significant challenges. So um, again, my hope is that this is not overwhelming, but it can sort of be as you take it all together. <clears throat> so things from the ecological or environmental uh, standpoint, these are just some of the challenges that were, um, I think, are related that, to the way that we do food, you know, as a community. So soil erosion and depletion. The Midwest has lost over 57 billion metric tons of topsoil the last 160 years due to erosion, which threatens future crop production and contributes to degraded soil fertility, making farming more costly and less productive. So, the soil erosion. Pollution, the Gulf of Mexico's dead zone, caused primarily by fertilizer runoff, typically covers about six to 7,000 square miles each year in the Gulf of Mexico. Dead zones where nothing lives, right? So there's no fish, there's no wildlife, there's no plankton, there's nothing. So it's there, where it is to It's not, the, that's not where it is, but that's from where it, Begins. Begins. So that's pretty wet. Right. It's fertilizer. So that's yeah. it's fertilizer, yeah. Well, I was trying to look it up today, and it is, and I can figure out what it was. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the soil erosion. Yeah, yeah. As a result of wind and lack of rain and uh, plowing. Plowing. And, 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 yeah, plowing it over plowing. So did we learn nothing from the Dust Bowl, I guess? Yes. Yeah, so, well, and the problem is the Dust Bowl is already its own set of not learning, right? So. Yeah. So when you go to like Israel and Palestine, right, it looks sort of like a desert and a very wasteland, like it used to be called the Fertile Crescent. Mm -hmm. right. So, mm -hmm. say a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, in that book I talked about last week, um, The Future of Farming with Michael Foley, he kind of talks about some of that about the history of over farming and land and desertification that takes place when you're over farming. So, that would be a good 
source to sort of dig into more deeply on that. So loss of biodiversity, the widespread use of monoculture, farming monoculture, which means there's one crop over vast, you know, acreage of the land. That should never, ever be. <clears throat> the widespread use of monoculture farming has reduced crop diversity globally by 75%, leaving ecosystems more vulnerable to pests, diseases, and environmental changes. So biodiversity, right, is part of what's going on in the soil. But because of all the tilling, there's no, um, there's no, uh, Live, there's no life in the soil, right? So you've got to let things um, in the soil, you know, be there and grow, do their thing. You gotta switch them up, you gotta save the soil. You gotta test. Well, this is gonna get too low, and some of you will be able to read it past my laptop by a part of this. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, industrial agriculture in the US contributes about 10% of the country's total greenhouse gas emissions, making it a significant driver of climate change. So you think about 10% of uh, 10% of the country's total greenhouse gas is coming from industrial agriculture, right? So one part of that is tractors and diesel and, you know, shipping food and all of that. But another big part, tractors, right, garbage tractors, but a big part of it is, again, is tillage. Because um, what's happening is when fruits are growing their roots down into the soil, like what's going on? The plants, through the power of photosynthesis, the miracle of photosynthesis, are drawing carbon out of the air and sending that carbon down into the soil. They're sequestering carbon in the soil, just planes do that on their own. Then we come through with uh, a tractor and a plow, and we break up the soil, we break up the roots, and a lot of that carbon that is released back up into the air through the process of tillage. So deforestation, agriculture accounts for approximately 80% of global deforestation, exacerbating climate change and resulting in the loss of biodiversity again, tangent. So those are just some of the, again, the ecological or environmental issues. I have a question. Yeah, but Okay. So cedar and of what well, is a base of species, they tell us the long endurance. If you buy a love fawn and go on cedar, the USDA, the USDA, uh, the fawn, he tells it, I have a most right, actually, gave you free loans to the your base in cedars. Yes. So I mean, really, I'm not, you know, I think I'll free the post. I had grant. Thank you. So I took my grant and I pulled a bunch of cedars so I could have more store. Oh, yeah. This, those cedars should show the trees and stuff. Yeah, they take a ton of water too. They yeah. suck up so, so much water. They're here and like, you know, like deep basing the earth. And I'm like, no, I'm getting the earth close. You want to look. Yeah. <laughs> were supposed to roam there. You wiped them out. So <laughs> it was like, the more mad is you could that the better. I'm like, <laughs> That's always good in your yard, like no grass. Start growing natives and you'll bring back up these little creatures that should be there. Yes. If you can get rid of some of the grass or like, oh, leave some of your grass, but not the ground. I have a trend to the natives. Any other comments on the um, ecology, environmental? Nice for me. Going to talk about putting everything in perspective, though, because we have millions of people to feed, and how are we going to reverse this and still feed people? Sure. You, you know what I'm saying? There, there's not, it sounds like, oh, yeah, we need to do this, but that takes time and we still have millions of people to feed and not end up starving. Right. Yeah, well, and part of the challenge, right, is that, um, uh, so again, Michael Foley has a really good section where he talks about that in his book, too. So we'll talk about it a little bit, probably not as extensive as they would. But then just to, I think we mentioned this last week that the, the profitability, productivity of land as it's managed is higher the smaller the bit that's managed. So uh, one farmer working one half acre is way more productive than one farmer working 10 acres. If one farmer working 40 acres is less productive still, right? And the way that we think about productivity then is even a thing that we have to talk about because the way we think about, then it kind of goes back to, or for Michael Foley, about thinking about food as a subsistence first issue. Right? So, but in the 1940s, something like 50% of people grew food in their gardens in their backyard and ate from their own soil during um, labor. Now it's like 0.2% of people are something like eating food that they contributed toward producing in any way. I get so much simple vibe. And so part of the challenge is that, well, how, what has to, I think, and now I mean, there's lots of different opinions, but. For me, I think that one of the things that has to happen is we have to help people to be um, responsible for their own food, again, in a way that's not, right? So that's what Mastic was talking about. 
being, so what, as they say, working for money has come, come to dominate all other value systems, right? So what do we do? We focus people on earning money so that they can be consumers. And then we try to provide lots and lots of things for them to consume. People are understood as consumers in like our economic modality, right? In our Western capitalist mode, we think of people as consumers and not as much as producers. I mean, now it'd be like everybody with their own like social media feed, I guess it's like some kind of a producer. <laughs> but in terms of contributing toward your own livelihood or your own well-being, right? People aren't keeping farms. People aren't raising animals. People are a thousand miles from where their food comes from, right? So that's what I didn't tell last time was that when I was here, I've been here, oh, I don't know, three weeks as a pastor and someone who's a member of the church, their mother had died. Their mother wasn't a member, but we agreed to do the memorial service. And then I don't know where everybody was, but all the pastors were gone. So it was me. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing my first memorial service for this uh, woman who I did know and her uh, husband and wife were members of the church. And I did what, what all nerds do when we feel a little afraid. I went and found a book. And the book is from a guy who was a parish priest in Wales. And, uh, and in this one section of the book, he just sort of talks about how in the old minister's service manuals, uh, they reflected the culture of the time. And the culture of the time, people very commonly died in their homes. And the minister would go, and then there would be some kind of a, uh, uh, a procession through the village, uh, taking the dead body, the dead person, uh, through the streets of the village to the church, right? And there's, so there's, in the book, there's the things you do in the home, and there's the things you do on the road, and there's the things you do in the church, right? And then there's the things you do in the churchyard when you're by late, laying the person to rest, like laying the person to rest. And he says, well, people don't die in their homes anymore. People die in hospitals or hospice care centers, or I don't know where people die, but basically never at home. So the section in the minister's book, the, the, set, the section for the home has just gone away. We don't use that section anymore. Mm. And then we don't have processions through the village anymore, like with the dead. So the neighbors and communities not coming out to recognize the death of this person and to share the grief and uh, the celebration of life well lived and all of those things. So that section that you do in the community, right, is gone. And then I guess that in, uh, if I understood it correctly, that in the British Isles, there's concerns about how many dead people can go into the soil over the passage of time. And so now, instead of being buried in the ground, uh, almost exclusively people are put in, like, in niches for, with their, you know, fermented remains. He says, so there's nobody who's buried at the churchyard anymore. So that section of the book has gone away. So he says, you can see all these cultural shifts by the way that the minister's service book is put together and they're getting them if they're there. No. So, oh, you know, it's the section or what the prayers you pray in the church. And then he says, uh, he kind of goes a little aside, and he says, not only we distance ourselves from the death of people, we distance, our, distance ourselves from the death of everything. Right? So we don't, uh, nobody walks into, this is my uh, sort of brief summary, but he says, nobody walks into uh, the grocery store and buys uh, ground beef that's shrink-wrapped to a styrofoam tray and says, thank you, God, for the life of this creature. Right? So he says, um, being far away from not only... Uh, death in its most, uh, you know, tell them, you know, intense and intimate settings, but even it's just most common and, you know, routine associations were far away from death. And I think that that's a part of what we're talking about. We say, like, how we've got millions of people to feed, right? Well, the question is, like, like if, how do we help millions of people to feed themselves again, which is what we did, you know, just a generation and a half ago. You know, I... I remember the first time it's been years ago, but that somebody pointed out that when we talk about how great American food production is, we forget that while one farmer does a lot of acreage, every India cook would never have been settled on that system because they get so much more of uh, each acre of land than we do. Yeah. You know, and, and so it kind of, that kind of leads us to think, uh, it, and most of our food is imported. 
we raise a lot of corn and soybeans, but you go don't eat that. Yeah, a lot of it goes to cows and things. So yeah, yeah, we raise it anywhere. I'm sorry, who was it that you said did the acre? Who would you refer to? In India. In India. Oh, yeah. Their type of farming yeah. gets a lot more out of each acre. Yeah. Our type of farming gets a lot of more out of each person. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's look at some of these economic challenges here. Uh, so you got corporate control. There are four major corporations that control over sixty percent of the global seed market. Right. So one of the things we figured out as a uh, human family was how to patent seeds. So there is no seed crop, you know, stock. There, you know, farmers can't hold back some of their stock and replant it, right? Because it's patented. What? Yeah, there's a big issue on that. Go on the corner. So this makes the diversity of crops are making it difficult for small farmers to compete. All right, farmer exploitation. Farmers in the U.S. experience suicide rates that are more than twice the national average, largely due to economic pressures and volatile markets. Uh, farm labor exploitation. U.S. farm workers earn an average of $13.99 per hour, generally without any benefits, making them one of the lowest paid sectors in the economy. Now, that's from reported wages, right? But there are lots of people who are paid under the table in unreported ways, of way less than that. Food insecurity. Despite being one of the world's largest food producers, about 34 million Americans, including 9 million children, face food insecurity annually. So is anybody familiar with the issues of having food deserts in like North Tulsa, for instance, where there's not accessible grocery stores for lots of people. So even though we've got lots of food growing, right, that it's not getting to the people who need it. Like it's Oh, if you want cars, so they have to walk to the oven seat or something? Yeah, or there's so much theft from the stores that they can't figure out how to do that, you know, profitably. There's all kinds of challenges, right? So dependence and vulnerability. Only around 2% of Americans grow their own food. Okay, so I thought it was 0.2, but it's 2%. Leaving the majority reliant on the industrial food system, which creates vulnerabilities to supply and chain disruptions, right? So we saw this during the pandemic. We worked with the folks at First Baptist North Tulsa to distribute food because when something happens with the food supply chain that people who are most quickly and disproportionately impacted are the poor. So people who have the greatest vulnerability are the people who uh, have the least needs. Right, so issues related to culture and arts. Um, there's cult cultural erosion. The industrialization of agriculture has contributed to a 50% decline in rural populations over the U.S. over the last century eroding community traditions and local culture. Right. So how many people have driven through a dying small town, right? I didn't need that. That's what, that, that. Loss of seasonality. The average, the availability of all foods year round due to industrial farming has disconnected many people from the natural rhythms of food production, contributing to a loss of awareness about the importance of seasonal eating and the natural cycles of the earth. Right. This is what we talked about last year. We'd say you can go to Sam's Club and eat February and find food parakeets. It's okay, well, that's a little weird. Yeah, but what's in it? What's in what? The blueberries. So, oh, yeah. Good blueberries. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, okay. they're, they're as good as we've become, come to expect. Political uh, issues, right? And of course, there's like, there's, you could sort these differently or whatever. It's just sort of, you, um, not entirely arbitrary, but you could, you know, reshuffle the deck and put them in different categories. That would be fine. Uh, it's just some way of kind of trying to organize it. Uh, corporate control, the five largest agribusinesses in the U.S. spent $32 million lobbying lawmakers in 2019, often to resist environmental regulations and protect industrial farming practices. $32 million lobbyists spend in Washington, D.C. in 2019. That's so. Uh, regulation and sustainable practices. Despite growing demand for sustainable food, less than 1% of U.S. farmland is certified organic, partly due to the cost and regulatory hurdles involved. So lots of people do. So we get our farm, our milk from a dairy in West Tulsa. And the folks who run the dairy say, we do all of the organic stuff, but the certification is onerous and expensive. So we don't do any of it, but you just have to take our word for it. And, and we do. It takes no credit to it. Um, and I know somebody else who does uh, dairy goats, and he's like, well, one of the things that's involved is not um, in the organic thing, is saying, I'm not going to do Antibiotics. He's like, well, I don't give my uh, goats antibiotics like prophylactically, but if they need them, I give them to them. I mean, if my children eat antibiotics, I guess it's it to them, right? So I'm not going to say, no, never any antibiotics at any time. It's like, well, you get a 
you know, it's, as far as it's all black and white, and lots of times those things don't even make sense. Some people say antibiotics deliver a poor metal, not palms. Yeah. So he said, I don't get the syndrome for um, Right. Well, or the other thing is that in uh, confined animal uh, situations, they have too many animals living in too small of a space, and so there's disease that becomes a problem. So industrial issues. So, so monocultural practices, we talked a little bit about that. In the U.S., 85% of corn and 94% of soybeans are grown using monocultural practices, which deplete soil health and increase vulnerability to pests. Uh, overuse of antibiotics in livestock farming. About 70% of uh, medically imported antibiotics in the U.S. are used in livestock farms, contributing to the rise of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Right, health and medical issues. Nutrient depletion of food. We talked about this a little bit last week. A study found that the mineral content of some crops, such as broccoli, have decreased by up to 50% over the last 50 years due to the industrial farming methods. What's that mean? That means that things aren't ripening on the vine. So we know that. The vast majority of nutrition content of a, of a plant, of a fruit or vegetable, comes into it late in its ripening. Mm. And so when it ripens on the vine, it's vastly more pulsable for you than it is if it's picked green and allowed to ripen, either disconnected from the vine or, you know, use some kind of chemical to accelerate that at the end. Just for you for use the word helpful and not help. It's in a big breath of this. Wow. I mean, pesticide exposure. In the U.S., Agriculture workers face about 10,000 cases of acute pesticide poisoning each year, primarily from exposure to parts of chemicals. And uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, we mentioned this with the animals, right? But the World Health Organization estimates that by 2050, antibiotic resistance could result in 10 million deaths annually, with overuse in livestock farming being a major contributor. Uh, health impacts from processed foods. Approximately 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy largely due to the comp uh, consumption of ultra-processed foods, which have been linked to chronic diseases, such as heart disease, diabetes, obesity. Um, um, yeah. And those all through the old ganner. Yes. I don't know how to make cheese. We eat mozzarella and cheese. I know. We got to do your a cheese plan. I'm going to do that like healthy cheese. Should we? We have to say cheese and a little left. Yeah. We can figure it out. How cheese. Down rain to make good cheese. He's a little bit grilling and cottages on that. The other challenges are we have lots of people who are full, but they're malnourished. Over 2 million people globally suffer from hidden hunger, where they consume enough calories that lack essential nutrients, largely due to the prevalence of processed and nutrient poor foods. Right. So, this is a real challenge for me because the Bible tells us that we should be feeding people who are hungry. Like, I was hungry and it gave me something to eat, but like, if I know that the food that I'm giving to a hungry person is just empty calories, right? There's no nutritional value to it. I'm like, how do I do that in a good, with a good conscience, right? How do I provide food for the poor? And I know that that food is awful, right? It's food that I wouldn't give to my family. I wouldn't give it to my children. I get food from the bank. Yeah. And then it lied with someone perishable. So now I know I thought perishable, but you don't get healthy. But it's car, it's... It's and then it's oh yeah. It's, yeah. You know, so if you're someone who's had to deal with diabetes, with big knocks you get, it's gonna make you really sick. Who's just, you know, bacons, needles, you know. Right. I'm not saying that's bad, but it's in not perishables and they're good. I think now keep the jelly full. Yeah. Uh, can, There's some issues related to education and research. Yeah, thanks, Rita. Developing sustainable agriculture education, farm to school programs that increase student fruit and vegetable consumption by 25%, demonstrating the effectiveness of education and promoting healthier and more sustainable food choice. Oh, the good things one. Um, but still, well, like when I go to Anderson and I go into their lunchroom and I look at food, I'm like, yeah, it's not healthy. It's not like USDA program, too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, partnering with schools for hands-on projects, currently 42% of U.S. schools have garden programs teaching students about sustainable agriculture and food systems through hands-on learning. So what I can tell you, though, is that um, there is like a farm on the ground at Emerson. I don't know if the students ever go through it or not, um, but that's uh, exceptional. There is a Global Gardens program here in Tulsa. And I, don't, I used to know the guy who's in charge of it, that he moved on, and I'm not sure who the new person is, but um, they were working with some schools in the Metro School District. 
And then this is the kind of thing where you just have to have a volunteer or some of the PTA who's passionate about it to make it happen because it's, it's just something extra and where the schools can't afford anything extra. Uh, faith uh, slash ethical concern to stewardship of God's creation. A survey by the Barney Group found that 80% of U.S. Christians believe the care for the environment is a biblical mandate, emphasizing the spiritual responsibility for creation with care. Theological concerns with animal and human welfare and human exploitation. In the U.S., over 9 billion animals are slaughtered annually in industrial farming systems, raising ethical concerns about humane treatment. I work in a slaughterhouse. We are very humane, super clean. And it was a small slaughterhouse, so it was, it was incredibly more dictated than the videos you might see in industrial slaughterhouse. Yeah. I can't say if those are videos that I did for you to see this and be like, oh my gosh. I can say in my slaughterhouse, this is exactly how we did it. What a different way. Was it chickens or ain't wedding or what? Large animals. Most folk, most of our clients did their own chickens. Um, but, you know, it was, it was like a bleach lasagna. Like, I don't know the cattle, you know, oh. they'd be in a big shoe and they would take them to the den you now. Ten that, you know, we have four. And uh, hit, hit, they die instantly because you hit the right and the brain between the spine. They call, they call, they fall. And then, you know, could take to the most, I mean, I'll read slide and we go straight onto a stainless steel table, come the slide, and then the next group is out through. Reach so it's like click the leash is on yeah. Yeah. So then bring in the cattle. Yeah, do it again and again. Yeah, we move it up. As soon as the tarp came out and then leash is on yet health and teach and I think it's just why we can't eat basis here. Well let's uh, let's well, keep let's keep it. We got a, a few just a few more slides here. Ethical farming practices, the adoption of regenerative farming practices such as rotational grazing has increased by twenty percent since two thousand ten. That's really great. I'll place her Rotational grazing has really like taken off as Australia, reflecting a growing shift toward more sustainable and ethical agriculture. Uh, and just as before, as mentioned, the United Nations reports that eighty percent of chronically that hunger people live in rural areas, many of whom are small farmers, highlighting the disproportionate impact of food insecurity mm-hmm. on the poor. Now, that's globally, not just domestically. Right. So then I think about how do I, as a Christian, like think about some of these issues, right? So one, at least one option. Right, because you take it on the whole, and it's like, like none of these things are making the nightly news, but they're all kind of urgent, and they all are serious. Remember, when was the last time you heard like this or saw something about this in the newspaper? Right, so there's this sense of, um, yeah, the the hallucinatory fantasy. I think is a great a great phrase. Yeah, has because we all are just kind of like, oh, everything's good. I mean, like we talk about, um, you know, this political cycle that we're in like everybody's talking about all the things that are like producing anxiety for them but like no one's talking about this like most of the two things that i have to hear about right it's like um it's like some of these food issues or something i'd love to hear someone talk about the other is like daylight savings if there's ever a politician that would just run against daylight savings i would vote for them okay like it's that's like same. that's like an untapped demographic i'm telling you but it's not how it is the year and it's talked about it hasn't happened so what one question is like, is, is judgment a way to think about this, right? So consider these words from Isaiah. The earth mourns and withers. The world languishes and withers. The highest people of the earth languish. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed bold gnaws. They have violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Mach. Therefore, a curse devours the earth. Then its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched and few are left. There's the true. The wine mourns. The vine languishes. All the merry parties sigh. Where is this from? And say, as, and that's from way back then, even. Isaiah 24. Yeah. So this is saying this is a mistreatment of the earth. Is like you know? Well, that's, uh, that's the question, isn't it? Is that, is that what this is saying? Well, I mean, it's in Skandali, isn't it? The earth and that animals and things were near before us. So we were putting our care there. We were just eating some of those, sodding those, those, so then. 
But to me, farming was the most simple, cool, simple, simple, logical thing. It's just either the sun I'm like, this is exactly how it works. And I'm like, why are people thinking it's so hard? Yes, yeah, I'm thinking of theory. So another question, maybe, uh, and I don't know if this is, um, I'm not necessarily advocating for this, but there's a little part of me that wonders, like, if there's not, um, well, some nefarious grander design, right? So Ephesians says that it, uh, to put on the whole armor of God, that you'll be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole order of God so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand for free. So sometimes I think, when I think about the, um, the sort of like wicked harmonic resonance between all of these different things, I'm like, okay, how is it that, uh, uh, you know, it's easy, it's, it's just too simple to kind of wave, uh, the wave of the like wicked capitalism flag and <laughs> feel like, oh, we're pursuing, we're chasing money. That's really at the heart of the things. We've come to love wrong things. Well, certainly, the love of money is the root to many kinds of evil. But then I also think, uh, you know, the scripture tells us that the enemies come to kill and to steal and to destroy. So when I think of all of the death and the destruction and the ill health and the vulnerability, right, that is a part of all of these issues, <coughs> when I think, well, that maybe has other fingerprints on it. And so I was saying, and there was no kind of politician that's been like, this was so funny to me because um, the politician who was dropping out finally talked about Big Ag, like on his way out the door. Right. He was hearing this talk. He says that, uh, and this, again, this is not blue. This isn't red. This is not a political party. So I was like, oh, look, at least some politician said the thing that I've been thinking about. He says that the uh, political party that he grew up in, hey, Sheila, you have you got here just in time for politics. I'm so sorry. <laughs> And he said that uh, the, po the political party that he grew up in had become the party of war and censorship and corruption at big pharma and big tech. And then he says, big ag. I'm like, oh, see, ag. look, there's at least one politician said it out loud. Now, I, if I had done that before he was like giving his I'm dropping out in speech, I probably would have learned more about what he had to say about it. But I was like, well, I, I can't vote for this guy anyway. So I didn't do a lot of research. He did like so remember just from last week, we talked a little bit about our, about our process. We're talking about text, we're talking about context, or we're talking about story. So the text of, um, well, I'm saying text, at least for our purposes tonight, I'm just trying to say, like these are significant challenges that we as the human family face together. And what is it that the church brings to this conversation? In what way does our faith invite us to speak into this with some kind of a distinctive voice. And then context is a little bit um, a, a, a conversation around the moment that we're in. And then story, I show you a little bit with you by my story last week, how my dad came to this place of um, pursuing different treatment for his mental crisis and that then um, it turned out that medical, that alternate method was actually highly validated. And then, um, the story of like, so things I've learned about through during the pandemic, even tonight, I was talking a little bit about how that gentleman who was the parish priest in Wales was talking about how the book kept getting smaller. Um, after I read that section about how we've distanced ourselves from death after the memorial health service was over, I, uh, called a friend of mine who's a missionary that we support the church and, um, he's a deer hunter. He's, they've got family land in Delaware County. And I was like, hey, will you take me out and teach me to hunt? And he's like, well, okay. So, so we started, that's when I started hunting, because I was like, you know, I need to be closer to the source of my food, right? So now I love, I look forward in November to going out and sitting at a deer stand. Uh, and if I see a deer, that's great. If I don't, that's great too. But there's something very um, rounding, I think, and healthful and and somebody's like normalizing about, um, you know, the way that it happens in the place that I'm on is if you shoot a deer, then you get it back to the house and you 
but a chain around its legs and you, uh, you know, hoist it up from the bucket of the tractor. And then, you know, you get busy, you know, cleaving. And so I want the car park people from the road are like, <laughs> you know, and so, and that meat, where's that meat going? <laughs> if I go deer, then as soon as I'm done at the farm, I drive to Siggy's, right? And they'll let Siggy's turn it into like, you know, roasts and ground beef and like mix in that pork. And he makes this delicious sausage yum. Um, and, and that goes in the freezer, right? We eat our family. Or like, what is it? Well, it's, it's processed acorns. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, we, it's like, this deer turned this these acorns into meat. I'm convinced that probably people talking about does something taste in gamey. What they mean is it tastes like acorns. Um, probably if we said our beef acorn instead of corn, they would taste the same way. Um, in Pennsylvania, they'd be all plowbers. Or some of like very, you know, like, because they need all your flowers. So I've got a little video to show, and I'll probably take us pretty close to the end, but I'd like to get us started. So this lady, I didn't know existed like this time, maybe just at this time yesterday. Um, but she is a physician. She uh, graduated top of her class from undergrad at Stanford pre-med, and she went to graduate or went to medical school at Stanford. She had fellowships at all these like impre impressive and prestigious places. Went uh, did a fellowship in surgery for five years, and toward the end of having spent nine years of her life pursuing this dream of like you know climbing the ranks and being a great doctor, she had this moment in surgery where she was like, like what are we doing? Here. Like, I'm operating on this lady and we're fixing this problem. We've done, done nothing to increase her health. And she won't be more healthy because of what we're doing. She'll just have less or different symptoms, but she'll still have lots of problems. <coughs> so, and then, um, yeah, so it's a long story. Let's just get the, the video started. And uh, what I really love about this clip is she talks a little bit about spirituality, and spirituality is part of her journey and about what she thinks is going on kind of in the medical industry. Um, so this is a little downstream uh, from food, but food is a part of the conversation too. There's a little bit, this is kind of clickbait <laughs> titling. So clickbait by like- I know, it's like, it's funny. She's like in the video, I'm like, you have the sweetest face, but they figured out how to pause it. And like, it's like, like mama. <laughs> it's like, let's see if people get this. The normal. This worked. Oh, this worked. Well, my name's Pete. At my uh, house. Ah! Hey, stop that. What's confused? It's giving me six pictures of the same thing. Super. What do we see? How does blood it by me too? To the right, what? Yeah, I'm just one. Did it? Which looks so looks pretty. That's crazy. That was picture there. I did did the clap. To now. Then he'll play South Stores. That's for eighty fifty percent. Connected to Cherry G O W R E L E M E T I V A. Say all the things. Oh, come on, Neb. Connected to ICER 1 2 KRO. It was really that I was nine years into my training, you know, four years of medical school, close to being done with five years of surgical training. And I was trained, I trained as a head and neck surgeon. And I kind of was looking around me and looking at the realities of what's going on in the Western healthcare system. And the reality is, is the patients in America, they're getting sicker every year. Like we're not, we're not getting better as a country in terms of health, even though we're spending monumental resources on health. And then kind of going deeper than that, realizing, you know, every single institution in America that touches our health, from hospitals to clinics to pharmaceutical companies, medical schools, even insurance companies, they all make more money when we are sick. And that's a huge problem. And I was a doctor working in a system in which the business model for the business, you know, people sometimes think healthcare is like a philanthropic organization or a nonprofit. It's not, it's a business. And that business is designed to grow. 
And as a doctor, you're a worker in that system. And the, the, the incentives are totally misaligned right now. And so even though I and my colleagues all go into this profession with the noblest of intentions to help people, this is a massive $4 trillion system that makes more money when we're sick. And that's a huge problem. And I left the system to go figure out ways to um, really keep people healthy um, through, through different means. Um, and I think what every patient unfortunately needs to understand is that no matter, no matter how wonderful your doctor is, the way we're trained, the way the research is done on every level, this invisible hand of gigantic financial incentives is corrupting the way we think about the body. It's corrupting the way we think about disease. It's making us not look at root causes and connections between diseases and put on these very siloed goggles about the body and about disease that is not serving patients truly getting healthier. So that is why I made that sharp right turn to really focus. Yeah, you know, and it, 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 it's a major issue. You know, I, I, many people have heard this, but the United States and New Zealand are the only two saying. countries that can all. market medicine the way that we do today via all of these commercials and also the financial in, in interests and government officials. There's lots and lots of issues here. In fact, you know, when I look at all of those different sort of big, uh, you know, industries today. I really think the pharmaceutical industry today is the most corrupt of all of them. See that? And it's, 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 it's not even, even more so than government, even more so than the food and cultural industry. I think it's the most corrupt. And I think it shouldn't be. And the, the reason why is it's so far from what it really should be. I mean, really, medicine should all be about just helping sick people heal get to the root cause of their issue and getting well, and it doesn't do that at all. In fact, the crazy part is you take one medication, typically causes another disease, so then you have to take another. So it really actually perpetuates the cycle, making people worse, and everybody breaks the Hippocratic Oath, uh, most MDs especially, first do no harm, because anytime you prescribe a medication, another another one, you're actually doing more harm than if you would have typically recommended a diet or supplement or lifestyle change. And so, yeah, I I don't really know if that's true or not. That's like his opinion. That's fine. You can agree with him or disagree with him. Um, again, I don't really know that guy at all. Fields. He's just the guy who's doing the interview. And most of the other interviews were like an hour long. So that's why I chose this one based <laughs> almost entirely on length of time. It's obviously a massive, massive issue. And, and what, why, why do you think today, because one of the things that I've heard people say before is, well, you know what? It's a lot of good people. Like doctors are good people. They're just in bad health care. And now I personally don't even think that's an excuse, though. I, I think that there is a lack of virtue and integrity because there are people like yourself or Dr. Mark Hyman or, you know, people that were more medically trained as MDs who were able to see through it and say, well, you know what, I'm gonna do the right thing and help people because I can see this isn't doing it for people. Well, what are you what, what are your thoughts about that? I think what's so interesting is that when we get caught up in this matrix, you know, you invest so much into becoming a doctor, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, years of the healthiest years of your life and, and with such good intentions. And I think it's very difficult sometimes to, to see this wild matrix of multiple industries that you are actually embedded in. And so you don't even actually see, I think, where some of the toxicity and some of the compromised interests come in. You've got this devil's bargain, you know, between a six trillion dollar food industry and the four trillion dollar healthcare system, and you know, a multi trillion dollar industrial agriculture system, which all together basically shape the way, like what our cultural norms are. You've also got the school system. You've got all these things that are kind of working together to create norms in our culture um, that that make it very difficult to see your place in it. I think, and when you've invested that much time. There are such strong cultural norms. You don't even have the government or healthcare organizations coming out and talking about, you know, root cause approaches to health. I think it's very easy to just get lost in all of it and to believe so strongly in this, you know, in this golden tower that you really like hitched your wagon to for your life. So, so actually stepping out, it's not just about saying like, I don't really believe, I think there could be a better way. It's actually like turning your back on, you know, 10 years of your life, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, and yeah. also kind of giving a middle, big middle finger to some of the some of the biggest industries in our country that we feel like we should trust, because if we don't, then your world kind of starts to crumble. And so it's, it's kind of bigger than just saying, I'm going to take a different career path. It's actually saying, like, I am going to walk on my own 
on a path that is different from what 99% of people are saying. And I think that what you speak of, though, is very important. I think there is, unfortunately, such fear in people kind of going out and, and forging their own path up. This is where it goes interesting because she's going to talk about fear for a second and then she's going to switch and she's going to talk about something like spiritual. Um, and I feel very lucky because I had a family that supported that and I had friends that supported that. Um, you know, I have a lot of privilege in terms of, you know, even having a family that would support me if I, you know, kind of fell on my, my face. And so I think there are a lot of things that push people to stay in the lane. But at this point, there's... I, well, there's a couple things I would say to that. One is that there actually is a lot of community on the other side of what's going on in conventional, the norms, like the functional medicine community, as you know, it's, it's really growing. It's strong yeah. and it's incredible. And I think the second thing is from a spiritual perspective, I think like really following that call of, of digging deeper and following what, you know, you kind of, what your inkling knows is right. You look at the system and it's failing. The system's actively failing. Fortunately, dollars of patients are getting sicker every year. There's something wrong there. And I think if you don't scratch that itch and start to go deeper, it can be very spiritually depleting because on some level, you know that the system you're working in is not working. And we see huge rates of depression, huge rates of suicide, huge rates of burnout in healthcare. And I do not think yeah. it's because we're working long hours. A lot of fields work long hours. I think it's because we know oh. there is a mismatch between what we're doing and what would be actually best for people. And we just don't know how to fix it, but we all have a voice. And I think it's really important for people to step up and realize we got to use it. Doctors are respected in society and it is really our job as individuals to create a movement. And the unlocking of, I think that spiritual purposeful fulfillment is something that you cannot underestimate. Like we have such a short life. And I think that, that one of the reasons we're seeing doctors suffering so much um, as a community is because, you know, they feel trapped in a system that they know is broken and they don't know what to do about it. Yeah. Well, well to your point, one of the good, good things is we see functional and integrative medicine growing. You know, I remember when I first got into the field, you had people like and, and you know, uh, as you mentioned, is there's really a lot of the industry, nice something that can happen at a spiritual yeah. level, but also <laughs> something that can happen at a cellular level at the health of our mitochondria. But break down for me what you mean by bad energy in your book versus good energy. Mm, yeah. So this builds perfectly on what we've been talking about, which is that really the financial incentives of healthcare drive it to be this very like siloed reactive system. Because if you think about the way that our system profits right now is that the more you do to someone for a longer period of time, the more money you make. So like that is that basically lends straight to, OK, we want to have a lot of chronically ill patients in the system because chronic illness is a type of disease that you're going to have for years and that need to be managed for years. Doctor visits every year. And the way we look at chronic disease in our country is it's like, OK, they're each different. High cholesterol is different than high blood pressure, is different than heart disease, is different than stroke, is different than dementia, is different than arthritis, is different than cancer. They're all different. So that's a bunch of specialists we can go see for life, and that is super profitable. Now, the, the, the other side of the way you could look at the body is, okay, well, all those symptoms are different, but what's actually happening inside the body and visibly out of the foot that's leading to these diseases? What's the physiology? What is the actual stuff going on inside the cells that are leading to these diseases? And if you look through that lens, what you would find is that there's a really poor set of not very complicated things going on inside the bodies of most Americans that are actually leading to all of those different diseases. And that's what I call bad energy. That is essentially a set of you know core cellular physiology that make our cells not work properly and when when cells are functioning properly when they're not powered properly when they have bad energy they're going to express dysfunction and dysfunction in a brain cell could look like dementia and dysfunction in a liver cell could look like fatty liver disease and dysfunction in a blood vessel cell could look like heart disease and so Bad energy is essentially a different way to look at health through the lens of root causes. And when we truly go to the research, what is the research showing us about the actual core mechanisms that are leading to disease? And the great news is it's not that complicated. It is metabolic dysfunction, which I call uh, bad energy. Yeah. Well, 
we need to talk. And so I think the core thing for people to understand is that, you know, just a visual. In our system, we look at every single one of these different chronic diseases in an individual silo, and we treat them in different specialist offices. But the reality is, the more we have specialized in healthcare, we now have over 100 medical specialties, the sicker we're getting. A different way of looking at it is a tree. The trunk of the tree is this physiology of bad energy, metabolic dysfunction, and underpowering of how our cells, you know, essentially an underpowering of our cells. And the branches of that same tree are all these different diseases that we think of as separate, but they're actually connected. So what we really need to do, and I think what the future of healthcare is, is actually treating just the trunk of that tree, treating the bad energy, turning it to good energy, which is metabolic health. And then what we'll find is that a lot of those different branches that we have conventionally seen as separate will get better. I think a key overarching framework for people to understand is that we have trillions of cells in our body, 40 trillion cells or more. And our life, our body is just the constellation of all these cells. And every single one needs a, a consistent source of power to work properly. Each of these cells are what we call factories, little machines, little cities, and they need constant energy to do their jobs. And when our cells do their jobs properly and are well powered, we have health. And when they don't, we have disease. And so a, a huge focus of what we need to think about individually and collectively is how do we understand how our cells are powered? How do we understand if we have good or bad energy? What is impacting whether we have good or bad energy in our diet and our lifestyle and the world we're living in? And then how do I prove it? And so that's really um, of all this digging over the years, leaving the surgical field and trying to really figure out like what is the root cause of what's ailing Americans? Why are our kids, ourselves, our parents all getting sicker every year? And the reality is it's, it's, a, it's this issue, this core fundamental issue in how our environment is hurting our cells' ability to make energy of power themselves. And we're basically, it's, we're broken machines and then we're underpowered and it's showing up as all these chronic diseases that we're, that we're seeing today. Oh, all right. So that's one to that. We're on satire stuff. Um, so to me, this kind of sort of resonates with me because it's so much my dad's stories that I shared with you last week, right? That he was given this diagnosis of uh, colon cancer and uh, they were happy to, for him to go and see all the specialists and see the oncologist and see the surgeon and on and on. And, um, and they would have been happy to pay for him to have colostomy bags the rest of his life. They were going to pay for him to have a cure juicing machine. Right? So the parents got a second mortgage and they followed what they felt like was God's direction for them. But like, he's going to see all of these things. And eventually she's saying, what the cells need is fuel, right? Like, where's that fuel come from? Poop. Right, it's just the things that we eat. And so when we think about the way that we have done food as a society and how it's shifted over the last 70 to 100 years, what we realize is that those things that seem, um, that we've decided were expendable in so many ways were essential. You know what, I can outsource the growing of my food. Well, that's fine, we're going to outsource it too. How are you going to know that they're going to do things in a responsible way? And so it takes us back to that book that I listed last week as kind of core, Michael Foley's uh, The Future of Farming. If his phrase that he uses over and over and over again is subsistence first farming. Or that the way that we do food should be to care for ourselves first. And we'll put a different level of care and attention and intentionality um, into food that we're growing for our own consumption. And then the things that are the overflow that are the um, abundance beyond our own needs that become the food that we give to others, the food that we can sell to our neighbors or coworkers or things that we can provide to other people that will give them good fuel for you know, addressing those issues in the trunk of the tree that she talked about. All right, so um, we are at three minutes for me. So and they talk back, and maybe that was like a little bit too, like too red pilly for some people. Um, I don't know, I got the little disenchanted with healthcare. Not, again, I love that she said, lots of good people, people with noble intentions, but like in the system that really is broken where the incentive structures are all backward, like 
that's I thought that was such a great way of saying it. The incentives are misaligned that we've incentivized the wrong things. And so we've uh, pursued the wrong things because that's where the incentives are. So I don't know, what do you think? Talk back. You can say, James, this is just too much for me. I, I have a lot of abs of these real quick. So I, you had the snack of books last week and I am bringing the pig book. Yes, yeah, it's good. It is fabulous. And I have spent this whole week, I'm um, reading this book and there's two videos, and I was going to share those with you because they are amazing. They bring, they, there's solutions to this. And, and the one specifically is this from 2018 called Fresh. I got it at the library. I'm going to take it back tonight. Have you all seen it? I think I've seen that one. It's amazing. A couple of them. It has yeah. solutions how to change farming. And yeah, we don't need the big court for farms, et cetera. And then the other one is American meat. So I uh, think that silence is the thing. This thousand? Yes. I think Joel's also on the He said, and I lived in Virginia for years. I never get word of him. Yeah. But now it, I understand sometimes it takes videos for people to see it. But he, what he's doing is amazing. And I'm sure we're doing that in Oklahoma. I just don't know about it yet. And I'm hoping to find out about that in this class. Yeah, some of the people who are going to be coming, but like really, um, we have really kind of, I, a Jackson Cypher, who's going to be one of our speakers, but he was speaking at a staff meeting uh, yesterday, and he said to the uh, staff, you know, we kind of re-nursed the week, and I was at home uh, nursing a cold. So he spoke on my behalf and just said, this is going to be a great class, and lots of folks doubt know these names or don't know this world, but this is an amazing light up of speakers that we have coming. So that was Jackson's take, and he said that you- I'm going to read major up so. This is the- Yeah, sure, sure. I got this table. Um, so, so the intern, I've been reading that stuff for years. Yeah. Information's out there, watching YouTube videos, those. But it sounds almost like, yeah, the information's there, but the people who are making the big money, they don't want it to change. We're going to make them big. They're going to be make like the car runs or the Pharmaceuticals. Is there? Is that where the problem really lies, or is it just because we're so we're born into this, and so it's normal for us to go into the doctor, seeing this, this, and this, and not getting ourselves out of it? Yeah, I'm gonna say both things are problem, right? So when she says that the incentives are misaligned, right? That's not only true of healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. That's also true of lots of other sectors. You know, and we're all kind of um, with. We have such a large, early size, and so as a result, I think we're so much, so very insulated from all of the, uh, it's all some, it all happened over there somewhere. Uh, and uh, you think about, you know, in, in terms of faith and theology and practice, that, you know, it, it, there are, there are a grinding, Agronomists, yeah, the, uh, that like that are large populations of, um, say, Mennonite or Amish community that live very differently and live within such all different set of rules and a bit much closer to uh, the way God intended. Yeah, it's, I mean, sometimes like that's true. There, there are also, yeah, I mean, there are Amish communities that are big, sort of. Buy their seats for Monsanto at yeah. Black Town. Yeah, I'm not. But they're happy. Talk to you. Yeah. I'm talking you know, about the brackets of day to day to live. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. And how they, they are productive in and for themselves and that they do a wonderful job. I and mean, we're doing more and more to like um, get more yields out of every possible acre that we do have. And not in always a good way, but in some ways with hybrid product and so forth, and I'm doing a thing. It's just, it's part of the conversation, I think. It's, yeah. it's how, how and what we believe, is how and what we frack with this, and how we can try to make, create an awareness of, yeah. Well, I think it's a big part of this class is just um, having that greater sense of awareness and sort of what the issues are at stake. So. Well, next people will hear from David. David's uh, their kind of family event in Maine, I think. So he's out west and or east and northeast this week. Um, 
then next week, so next week he'll share his story. The first Wednesday in October, Erin Martin from Fresh RX is going to come and share her story with us. It'll be really good. Um, the night, uh, either we'll have a guest speaker or I'll offer my next presentation. Um, we kind of got a couple people I'm waiting to hear back from. Uh, after fall break, we'll have a time with Rodney Frazier, who's the sort of the director of the facilities of the farm of right, the refuge for John 316. Holly Dallenberg is there. The bee lady, we affectionately refer to her at our house as the bee lady. Uh, and she's, she's great. Um, James Spicer, the director of Green Hens and Permaculture, good friends for the community. Um, and he's done a lot of work with the folks at John 316. <laughs> he's just going to share his story a little bit with us. Uh, Greenbelt Farms, Jackson Cyber, our in Jackson Cyber from Pathfinders, um, has his own little journey of growing this kind of agricultural world. Um, so hopefully then the 20th, whichever doesn't happen on the 19th, will happen on the 20th, October 9th. After Thanksgiving, we'll just have one kind of closing uh, wrap-up session. And I, my hope is actually mostly in that time on December 4th, just to hear from some of you kind of what your uh, impressions or uh, feedback or thoughts, you know, what, what, uh, what's your takeaway from the time we spend together this semester thinking about some of these issues, so. I'm glad you did the bad news tonight. It's very depressing. Very depressing. It really gets me down, but I will go to my scripture to, to help me with that. So basically, it's really not, I'm not, I don't know, but well, sometimes this is been my anxiety. Well, I was just even like, you know, I just take care of it. Every year you have to pray, ask me. You can always say, you know, you know, can see chicken, snake of work. You're on your first. The inner cheese for a field turn. You know, I would love to work that trip. I think you should add it. <laughs> no. Uh, everybody's like, bring your calendars when Rodney's here. And uh, we can try to get some schedule. I like love that so much. I think he's yeah. I just want to write down with him on some that the bird, but you're not that weak. You can want that. Well, I think. Um, okay, well, I've gone and lost. Yeah, there's, I mean, they thought so. You maybe? It'd be great. Yeah, John Tristan the same days. But she's such good work. Speaking of hospitals and medical. Their facility's just super impressive, too. So. Would anybody you dare want to go for anywhere? So, yeah, it was. Yeah, it's what I'll fit. Oh, yeah. It's okay. I mean, that's new. Hey, John.